Okay, well, thanks, Vinas, for the, for the introduction. I feel like we should go now because you were talking about some other people. But anyway, um, we're going to tell you about a system that may or may not run inside our data centers that helps us with our media processing. And it uh, feels like an IoT style, right? I mean, let's put in uh, more buzzwords. Right, sure. So one of the things we do at Disney Streaming is we're involved in uh, streaming live events, sports events and things like that. And what happens in those cases is the media comes to us from a provider and it reaches one of our data centers. And then it goes through some, some special hardware to be processed. And then what we need to do is maybe transcode that video, segment it, various things like that before broadcasting it out to the web. So what we have is a lot of different devices, as we're going to call them. And some of them are literally physical devices. Others could be software, virtual machines. Doesn't particularly matter. The important thing is that these devices, maybe they fail every so often. Sometimes they just fall over. And so what we need if we're broadcasting lots of streams is to have some way to observe and understand the status of all these devices that are involved in the media processing pipeline. So we want to build a system which can allow us to control the stream processing devices, but also give us a global view of that pipeline so that the operations teams can understand what's happening across the, the various data centers and various streams. Yeah, absolutely. So the, so the, key was, the keywords are global, and the keywords was to bring in all these devices which definitely aren't reactive in the way that we would understand reactive and bring them up in, into this reactive world. And so, so we, for better or worse, we, we built this. And uh, hopefully uh, what we would like to do today is to share some of our lessons while we were building this kind of system. And hopefully that will allow you to uh, you know, go to work, well, maybe not tomorrow, but the day after and go, yeah, this is, this is exactly what I want to do. This is how I'm going to improve this is how we're going to improve our systems. OK, so we have a couple of clickbaity slides. Um, but don't worry, there is some substance behind them. And we'll, we'll talk about them. And these, these are exactly the kinds of things that we've observed while we were building this system. And we'll give you the tips to avoid them. So the first one is, distributed system without durable messaging easily grows into a monolith. A distributed monolith, that's, that's even worse kind. OK, so like I described, we have a device. And what we ultimately want is to put something in front of that device so that if I want to send a command to the device, it will go through this thing that sits in front of it. And then it reaches the device. And maybe we record some information, ongoing information, about what commands this device has received in its lifetime, what, it re what its responses have been to those commands. So it sounds to me like this is, this is all pretty simple. We'll have what we'll call a shadow which looks after the device, and we'll have the device. Can we just connect all these services up by REST APIs? Yeah, that sounds like a perfectly sensible thing, right? This is a simple thing. We have a box somewhere. It has a, uh, an HTTP API. We want to build another reactive component in front of it. And it's REST, right? I mean, it would be if we didn't need this global world view of the world, if we didn't have lots of these devices, these devices didn't like to fail. So this doesn't really quite work. A lot of the main, one of the main problems with this is our code is perfect. I was waiting for the, for the laughs, but OK, yeah. So our code is perfect, but this device is broken. And inevitably, what people would ask us is, well, what did you send this device? How come this thing failed? It must have been you. What did the device do? Maybe you can replay what you did. So I was going to suggest we just write it to a log file, right? OK, yeah. And, and because we've got lots of devices and lots of data centers, uh, maybe we can just have some kind of distributed logging thing. you know? And we'll, we'll just pull all these log files together. And I like log files because I can open them in Emacs and I can understand them. Yeah, the, some of the problems were, of course, the log files were getting big. The log aggregation would be problematic. So really, if you have a distributed system, across multiple regions, multiple data centers, the log files aren't necessarily the thing to do. You might, OK, you'll write it to a log file I had an animation. How about writing it to a database? And there were suggestions of doing that. You could, you know, you could take one of these wonderful cloud databases and then connect a stream of updates and have uh, like a database in, as an integration. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we could use DynamoDB. And you know, even if you've got multiple regions, we can use a global table. Everything's fine, right? So that's also not a good idea if you want to integrate services, if you want to make sure that they can recover 
if you want to replay them. Where we're actually heading, of course, is you want to have some sort of durable message queue. You want to be able to write these messages and consume them. You want to make sure that when a new service starts up, they can subscribe to events that other services have published. So again, going down the, the usual reactive architecture style, right? It's durable. Now the question is, how long do we want to keep the messages in these queues? Forever. Well, yes, right, forever, except forever costs a lot of money. So you want to define some sort of policy. You want to keep, maybe you want to allocate disk space. Maybe you want to allocate time. Uh, but in any case, for a long time, that allows you to build a system where other services can subscribe to events that other services publish and have this sort of wonderfully fluid architecture. This all sounds like a perfect thing to build unless you're building some sort of global workflow-based system, in which case you really shouldn't be doing this. But that's not our talk, so we can get away with this. Oh, okay, fine. So X is able to subscribe to messages. It can pull them off Kafka, but how does it understand what those messages mean? What do you mean? Well, what well, they mean? I need to be able to interpret those messages in some way. Do they have some sort of structure, maybe a schema? We'll get to that in a moment. Yes, you need to very carefully define the protocols that your applications use. There are wonderful tools that you can use, and we'll get to that at the end of the, towards the end of the talk, where you can actually use these protocol definitions to usefully damage your system. And that's actually incredibly helpful. So, OK, 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 yes, 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 giggles. We have one more. Distributed system without supervision is binary, working or failed? Um, I don't think you can say anything else to it, right? Failed. Um, here's what it looks like. So let's, let's have some code, right? You might sort of look at this and go, OK, here's what we're going to do. Let's uh, make this device request, whatever that is, gives us a future of device response. And then we run it, so to speak. And on complete success, on failure, well, you should at least log it and then maybe try again. You're cringing. Oh, I get that. This is, this is terrible. You don't want to have this infinite loop, so you might want to add a timeout, right? Let's invent this magical number. A thousand milliseconds later, we're going to try this same request. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's, here's what's going to go wrong. And we've seen this in a lot of our systems, and uh, hopefully we'll give you a tip on how to avoid it. Naive timeouts cause. What do they cause? Um, wait a minute, hang on. See, I need to press a button here. Oh, no, wait a minute. It's, oh, 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 they cause that. <laughs> they cause more and more and more time on, and it's really difficult to figure out what happened. They cause other timeouts, and you, it's unpredictable. You really don't know what happened. And they cause excessive downstream load if you combine them with these sort of naive tryouts, uh, uh, retries. So here's what happens. You might say, OK, 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 circuit breaker. How about that? Let's do a really simple thing. So requests are coming in. And then when the requests stop coming in, we're going to open the circuit breaker, which protects the downstream device. OK, OK. Keep that thought. And you then design this kind of cascade. And I've seen this loads and loads and loads of time. So service one calls service two calls service three. And then you start with this. You say, OK, I'm going to give this one 2,000 milliseconds for a timeout. Seems reasonable. Someone put two seconds out. And then the downstream one, you'll, you'll reduce it by a little bit. You'll go 1950, because you know that the upstream one wants two seconds. And then, so this one wants 1900. That's the first level of mess. And then what happens is this. You then say, OK, well, let's, let's add retries into it. Let's give three retries to this one, and two retries to this one, and three retries to this one, and great British flags for everyone. OK, and then you do this. Then you do this sort of retry timeout calculus. You know, 600 milliseconds here, and divide that by two, divide that by. It's a total mess. Notice also that this number is bigger than the timeout on the first service. So if the first timeout happens, you're going to send another request because you've configured it that way. It's just a terrible idea. All right, well, I can't reasonably be expected to know how, what timeouts are involved and how many layers of timeouts there are when I'm talking to an arbitrary service. So what's a better approach? What's a better approach? I'll, I'll, I'll make it worse, and then I'll give you a better approach. You think this is not going to happen to you because you've written this software, right? Well, the trouble is, this first service, that's the team old radio that wrote it, 
and he, you know, team old telephone wrote this, this, this other service, and then you have a team floppy disk that wrote this other service. They have published the protocols, but they have forgot to publish detailed description of when are they going to respond? What are their, what's a better word, what are their deadlines? That's a much saner way of thinking about it. It seems that on the previous slide, we forgot one of the reactive principles, and we said, oh, timeout, which means the service is just going to forget to respond. That's a terrible idea. You need to respond with something. Otherwise, if you don't respond, you're dead, and someone is going to have to restart you or do something to you. So it's much saner to say, okay, each service has a deadline, and in this deadline, it's going to respond, even if it responds with, I don't know, or even if it responds with a pre-baked, pre-computed response. And then what you add to it is some sort of quality of service. We found out, Matt, didn't we, that not all messages that we send to these devices are the same. Right, yes. Yeah, so the, it's, we're just forwarding all messages, right? So someone tells us, tell this device to do such and such. And we pretty much just assume we can forward what we get onto the device and everything's fine. The, the problem is that if you, you treat it that way, there's hidden details that do all sorts of crazy things. We couldn't possibly predict. Like, yeah. We fail to pass through a particular and header. Like where I'm getting thing. with some of the QoS is if I want to tell the device to stop encoding a stream, that's a little bit more important than just a simple yeah. status message. And baked into this QoS policy that you define on each of your services, you might want to think about a retry budget. Not count, but budget. You would say over a fixed period, over a time window, I am able to retry 20% of the requests. Not each request three times. And I have a deadline in which I have to respond to my upstream service. You then externalize all of these things into some sort of file of some kind. It doesn't matter what it is, but you need to pull it out. If you have these timeouts baked into your code, it's almost a disaster. In 20,000 lines of code of Scala, you'll never find it, uh, which we will talk about in just a moment when it comes to monitoring. We had some fairly unpleasant experiences by you know, getting woken up in the middle of the night because we didn't really know exactly what our services were doing. Anyway, pull this out, externalize it, think about deadlines and QoS rather than timeouts and retries. So, so now, we, now we're here again, aren't we? So we know that this is a bad idea, but bear with us just a moment. So you'll, you've, you got rid of this by um, you know, doing deadlines re and, um, and, and QoS. Let's, let's, let's improve it in connection with the slide that you saw on, on the, with the previous slide that talked about configuration, pulling out all these details. This is like HTTP. It does wonderful things. It does back pressure, asynchronous back pressure. It talks over to some RESTful API at the, at the back end. Not a problem. This looks reactive. You can even recover with retries. This is all fantastic. Is this the right thing to do? There's so much hidden. What is hidden? Uh, Matt had the unpleasant experience of discovering. Ah. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Well, Acker HTTP does everything we need out of the box. That's yeah, the, we thought the naive that. view. Nothing we ever works that. quite like that. There's, there's all sorts of hidden variables. So how do you think about supervision in this case? Well, here's the thing. You have these low-level, call, call them actors or components. They make these device requests. And we've already figured out that we have this deadline. We say that these components, when they work, they really work. They respond even if they cannot talk to the device underneath them, but they, they are lively, right? You know that they are working. But if they don't respond, so these guys, when they you know, run these make device requests, if they really fail, if there's a genuine timeout, connection denied, that sort of business, then they should fail. Like failure is a different than I'm responding because I didn't hear back. This is like something much worse has happened. And you allow this failure to propagate to a supervising component because that's the place where you can maybe recover or make a you know, sensible decision. And then it turtles all the way down, right? You build this up 
all the way down to the level of JVM, and then you're running in some sort of container, so you build it up. Your goal is to keep your software running and not restart too much. Link to that is this slide. Yes, so a distributed system without back pressure will fail or make everything around it fail. If you think about what we're trying to do, we're commanding these devices, what we really don't want to do is break them Yes. in some fundamental way. And you, know, you would be thinking about it and saying, well, what can happen to me? So, so it, it's true that even with back pressure, you are either the biggest thing on the internet or someone else can DDoS you. That's, there's no question about that. But you can at least be sensible and be nice to, the, to your downstream components and not hit them with everything as long as they have a sensible way of reporting whether they can consume more traffic. So let's take a look at this. Like, why, why do we have this? Oh, I know, I know. Um, you, you might remember, so, so we work for this company that makes this, uh, these, these movies. And one of the critical, I think, design decisions when building the Death Star was this. Let's just go with the defaults. It'll be fine. What could possibly go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? And again, it's linked to the previous, previous slide where I talked about the deadlines and the timeouts. You have to pull out these implicit defaults, this sort of default configuration for components. Not because you don't trust them. That default configuration might be perfectly fine. But you want to be able to see it and inspect it. Here's what we mean. So it's the same code. Where are the defaults buried? Well, they're, they, they're buried here, right? What's the TCP pool size? What's the TCP connect timeout, the TCP receive window? We have this, how many retries? What's the time frame? When we do retry, can we, can we do delete twice? Maybe we can. Can we do post twice? Can we do a put twice? And we have more stuff. And, and Matt, you discovered more stuff when it comes to you know, the, the details of networking in Kubernetes. Yeah, but it is important to bear in mind some of these defaults aren't things that we can even control in JVM. They're things that happen above us in the kernel, perhaps, or things in a container, maybe in the, the Kubernetes network layer. All of these things as well can, can influence your performance. So our tip, the first thing that you should do maybe on Monday hunt through your code and find out where things are configured and pull them out, even if you have to repeat it, even if you take the default configuration and then write your own that's exactly the same, but at least you know, because that's neatly linked to this. You should observe. A distributed system of our observability and monitoring is a stack of black boxes. So we're building a thing that allows us to observe and monitor other things, but of course we also need to observe and monitor our thing. So it's monitoring and observability all the way down. Well, indeed. Um, my first question, of course, would be what's the difference between monitoring and observability? Okay, yes, that's, that's a wonderful one. And You know, I, I found that if you Google this, you find a lot of very long-winded articles trying to make what I think is a very succinct point, which is that monitoring is able to tell you when your application fails. Observability is the facility for you to find out why. Hmm. And that actually seems reasonable. So you combine the, I guess what I would call, because I haven't done this work on the, you know, the, the, the pointy end of things, you'd monitor the some sort of OS thing. Yeah, so maybe you've got some sort of, uh, it could be a new relic agent or something like that, hmm. looking at your, your real resources on your real operating system. OK. Uh, then you monitor, presumably, the containers, as in, is yep. the service running? Is the container, container running? Do we have the right Do we numbers? have enough of them? OK, OK, so we get containers. Now, what do we get out of our JVM? So this actor system monitoring. Yeah, no, actor wait, systems. observability. What, what is that? Actor systems are, are full of all sorts of exciting things. So we, we want to know message queue sizes. We want to know whether there are dead letters, dead letter hmm. errors other kinds of areas, actors are restarting. Okay. Timeouts uh, as well, of course. Uh, timeouts, you want to monitor sizes of threat pools, you want to monitor sizes of queues, you want to have priority queues. These people have priority queues. Don't have these unbounded queues. They'll, they'll kill you. Drop messages if you have to, but then monitor. Uh, no, observe. Observe that your yes. messages are getting dropped. 
OK, and then you instrument the JVM. Right? So you want to know how much memory it's using, how much CPU yeah. it's using, all, all that stuff. All the standard stuff. things, your heap size, stack size, these sorts of things. Now, sadly, that's then connected to our mobile phones, uh, which is another business. But all of this is actually really, really closely connected with that configuration that I urge you to pull out. How are you going to configure your incident management thing when it is a like an endpoint starting to fail. Oh, oh, I know. When the response is more than 1,500 milliseconds. Why 1,500? How do you know? And we made that mistake of just pulling a number out of thin air by, we, we, we had a look, right? We had all these dashboards, and we went, no, 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 yeah. most of it is under 1,500, so surely if it's more than 1,500, that's some sort of error. We start out very cautious, and then the result is, a lot of us got woken up at two in the morning hmm. for things that really weren't, weren't issues. So if, you, if you've pulled out all of your configuration details, you can then configure your incident management to really match up with what your software is expected to do, with what you told it to do, with how your components are supposed to talk to each other, and then your incidents will be the ones you really have to worry about. Okay, we have another one. Um, so you've built this. This is all fantastic. It's configured. It's running. You have all these services. It's monitored. It's observable. It's monitored. You're Everything running you it want. in some sort of reasonably secured cloud. You have VPN connections everywhere. You have firewalls. So why We've got we some worried? kind of protocol as well, which is published somewhere. Sure, we'll get to that. So why are we worried about this? Well, well precisely because we have um, durable message queues and we have a known format for writing messages to that queue. Two things can happen. Firstly, somebody can accidentally write the wrong message. It's malformed. It's got some wrong value somewhere that's going to break something in a horrible way. Or indeed, it could be part of, uh, say, you've run an integration test against the wrong environment with arbitrary data that shouldn't have been published there. Oops. What could also happen is someone could be malicious. Mm. An open access message queue like, let's say, Kafka, it's just as bad as having no checks on, say, a REST endpoint. You know, you're going to do your, your sanity checks on your REST API. You're not going to accept arbitrary data on Kafka. That's exactly it. And you, you can't just have security at the REST API slash load balancer level and say, if anything comes in, by the time it's reached my internals of my system, it's all cool. I'll just accept anything. So we've taken precisely the opposite approach and said, Everything is malicious, everything is bad, until, unless we can really <coughs> prove that whatever we ingest in our systems really comes from a thing or a user that is allowed to publish such message or make such request. So, uh, oh, we have a diagram, look, look at this. So how do we do it? Um, the first question I have is this, these, these private keys, public keys, are they baked into the containers or what? Well, uh, you know, surely all I need to say is things like RSA and keys and you'll believe that it's secure and then I'm done, right? No, perhaps not. Well, the idea is this. We have a message, it's published in, it contains some kind of structure to it and maybe we have a set of common headers for all of our messages. Mm. And what we can do is say each service, when it publishes a command that other services might execute, or indeed an event which other services might observe and react to in some way, we can sign it. So we'll use a private key to sign a message. We'll put the signature alongside the message payload, and then service B will pick it up. It will use the known public key of service A to verify that signature, so it will do the same encryption and hash and, and see if it gets the same result back. And if it's valid, then it will do whatever it's going to do. And if it's not, then it will reject it. Absolutely. So, so why uh, gone too far? Why the token? Ah, well, the token allows you to specify a set of capabilities. So these are things that services are allowed to do. So when service A publishes a message, it will make a claim. It will say, I want to do this thing. I have these capabilities. And here's my cryptographic signature to prove both of those, those two. Now, this is all sounding very much like JWT, because it is. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, in fact. So that's what's baked into the token. Now, in this world, we don't encrypt the payloads between most services. There are some services that do really, really, really interesting stuff I wish we could tell you about, but it's all encrypted, so we can't. But 
believe me, it's really cool. Well, you'll, you'll see that later on um, when, when it's all released. So, of course, but your next case, question is going to be about these keys, right? Yeah, the keys. I was going to say about the keys. So where, where do they live? Ah, well, what we do is we just, you know, commit them to Git and then... <laughs> no, don't do that. So the keys need to be stored somewhere secure. They need to be generated for each service in each environment. They need to be unique per environment. They need to be handled very carefully. So maybe we store them in some kind of key management service. Every cloud provider has their own version of this. We do not commit them to Git. We do not email them to people or put them on Slack or anything like that. Apart from the public keys, public keys are by their nature public, but the private keys. Well, what this allows us to do is to really be much more comfortable about our testing. So we can really run performance, we can run destructive tests, and we can be sure that the keys that we were given, even if we misconfigure it, even if we make a horrible mistake, we're not going to break a system that's already running, dare I say, in production. That, that would be a very, very bad thing. OK, now we get to even more interesting stuff. So this is all fantastic. This all works. Well, hopefully, you've picked up some, some interesting things. But now, chaos testing. Now, you, you probably know about chaos testing. There is, you might have heard about this other streaming company, or whatever the name is, that does chaos testing. Um, well, OK, we use that. But there's one more step before you get into chaos testing your infrastructure. And uh, it took us a, a pretty long while to realize that we should actually do this. But, OK, what's this? Well, how about this? OK, I have a protobuf message. And the first line of bytes, the 8, 1, 12, and so on, that seems like a perfectly good protobuf message. And then what I've done is just appended ah, about 2 kilobytes of these 99. It's just a number, right? 99, it byte value, looks 99. perfectly reasonable to me. Perfectly reasonable, yeah. right? Now, this is protobuf. It's, this is it's protobuf, Google, by, the, by the way. It's fine, right? So. The problem is here. This is a maliciously constructed message. What's going to happen is this will fail. Does anyone know how it's going to fail? Excellent. Stunned silence. Good, good, good. Now you think, of course it's going to fail. This is an invalid message. So if I say parse from, that has to throw an exception of some kind. Well, OK, so let's change it. Let's change it to validate. Surely this feels right. This is a code that you got generated by the protobuf generator. So you say x.validate. What, what you should get out of it is, in Scala world, a try of x. So it's either a success, in which case you're holding the, the instance of x, or it's some sort of exception. What you're actually going to get is a Stack Overflow exception. And that's pretty unpleasant. And you think, oh, no, no, uh, it's my fault. Using protobuf, you should be doing JSON. OK, you can try this. Let's open up 2,000 levels nested JSON, see what happens. Again, depending on the parser, but in some parsers, you get exactly the same thing. So this is first level of unpleasantness. And of course, to get to a Stack Overflow exception, your services have to do some computation for a while, which means that all your deadlines are blown out of water. You can really you send 10 messages like that, and you've DDoS yourself. So that's pretty unpleasant. We can make it even better. So this is a protobuf definition of, of a message that we sent to one of the services. And uh, the good thing about protobuf, or in fact any kind of protocol definition language, is that it's machine readable. You can write a tool. And you can go, OK, well, I can see string. So it's, you can now start thinking about, how do I generate these strings? What are possible strings? OK, empty string, and like a sensible string that says get, and like a 10 kilobyte <coughs> excerpt from, from Shakespeare. Um, bytes, same story, right? What's an array of bytes? Oh, an empty array. Uh, a megabyte of zeros, 10 megabytes of zeros, 10 megabytes of random text. And you, know, you have enums, which fix your choice of values. And so in addition to that, you can add a little bit of heuristics, right? Methods, that looks like a HTTP method. So you, let, you, you can have a little generator. In fact, we have a generator um, that we can share with you. And a thing that ends with time, that might be a, like a time or a time step. We don't anyway. even need to be too clever here, right? We just, we're just look, looking for keywords in the protocol definition, right. saying, oh, that's probably time. I'll generate a time. Hmm. 
That's exactly. And so one of the messages that you generate, given this protobuf definition, one of the payloads that you generate is this one. That seems perfectly reasonable. And then you can start messing with it. Right? This is a generated test. And so you now go in the past, which is going to cause an exception here. This is good, right? This is a good date. But now you're trying to schedule something for minus four or five years. So that's going to fail. Um, you will then change the date. This is not a good date. So now this is going to fail with an exception. Again, you should check for it. And then you can generate this. Well, I know, right? Th th these are fantastic. These are uh, these weird Unicode modifiers. Um, I would encourage you to try it and see what breaks because an awful lot of things start breaking. So this was uh, a bit of a problem with one of the card payment services. Never mind. But the good news is we've generated all of this stuff, which is a total mess, except the code that you see below you, the only validation you have is for the date and for the retry misfire strategy. So the code here is going to work. And what you're going to do is schedule this stuff to happen at some point later. And this happened to us, and it was horrific, because we would accept a message, we would consume it, process it, seemingly everything was fine, and then our service would crash. At the, some the point next in the day, future. The next day, right? This, is, this was horrific. So, so we've built this tool that allowed us to generally use our protobuf definitions to publish deliberately malicious messages on our message queues. And then we will re really see what breaks. When we were happy that everything stays, then we added all the infrastructure chaos where we you know, turned off services, scaled things up and down. So what have we seen? Uh, we've seen one of these, right? So we, you could generate a date with a little smiley face that really isn't a valid date. You can spot that. That was easy. That's not a time zone yet. That's not a typo. This is, this, was a, this is a real generated date. What about this one? Any tips on what that might have, what, why that might have failed? We've seen this in our logs. And believe me, you don't want to see that in your logs. Any tips on what might be wrong? It took us also a pretty long time. Don't worry. Um, so the hint is that the T, this T, isn't exactly the right T. It's a Unicode special T. Yeah, you see it in your logs and you want to kill someone because this is just not right. Why is it failing? This is a valid date. What's wrong? And of course, your service fails and then it restarts and it consumes the same message from this durable log. It's insane. So you should really test for it. You should build a tool that you should use this tool that allows you to do this sort of crazy testing. Um, and then we had this, which was also great fun. Oh, are you being silly now? This is obviously a bug in the JVM. It's not my problem. No, I agree it's not our problem, except we are the ones who get woken up because our software is broken. And whoever use, is using our services phones us up and says, I tried to use your service. It's down. It's not there. Yes, it's a bug in the JVM. Uh, don't worry, it's fixed. It's, it's gone. But what you want to do is you want to generate the messages that unearth it generate horribly broken messages. This was one of those weird 10 megabytes of bytes that pretend to be content type, which pretends to be some sort of string with broken Unicode. That's it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have thought, no one is going to send me 10 megabytes worth of header. Well, if they do, then they're going to break, uh, bring your service down. And then, of course, you have the, the final point where, and this is more our feeling now that we're a, we're a big company, this is perfectly good, but of course, we could generate data breach further down the line. And in our position now, it doesn't really matter that it wasn't our fault. If we make a mess, our customers are going to talk to us, and they'll say, you made it, you are at fault. So test, test, test. So this was test an exploit everything. in Apache Struts? Uh, yes, it, 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 like was, it was a total mess. OK. There's a big list of these naughty strings, if anyone's interested. Uh, completely safe for work. Um, yeah, they're, they're actually really good. Try every one of them and see what breaks. You'll be surprised. OK. We're nearly, no, we have one more thing. 
We have one more thing. We have five minutes. Don't worry. We're not going to keep you longer for lunch. But we have one more thing. So back in our consultancy days, years back, this is where the talk would end. I would say, OK, you guys need to be building these reactive systems. This is all fantastic, message-driven, scalable, elastic. This is how you do it. But now we thought, is it really true? We are all nodding. I agree this happens to be the way to build the systems. But is it really? So, so we measured some things. We took um, about 30 internal projects that we have at work, and we measured in every commit, in every file, in every project, we built a system that does classification of the kind and quality of the code. So we trained it on, on Stack Overflow. And what we wanted to know is, given this file, what's in, what's in it? What is it talking about? Is it doing Scala with back pressure with actors? Or is it doing Spring Framework with Spring Data? And based on text analysis of the Stack Overflow answers, we had the quality. What I mean by that is, did the Stack Overflow text around it say, this is a good idea, do this? Or did the Stack Overflow text around it say, no, this is a terrible idea, don't do this? And we matched this with production performance from our pager duty. And here's what we found. So this is what we actually measured. We had many, 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 many source files. So this is everything that, every source code file in every commit, all the history of our projects. Uh, we had some incidents. These aren't exactly the real numbers, so you know, don't, don't look into it too much, but at least an illustration. And then we were able to build functions that provide sort of interactive diagrams of what's inside our code base. And uh, here's what we had. So here's one example. These are all the files in all the projects at a particular point in time. And so our question on the top diagram would be, where, is, where are the best examples of performance testing in these files? Automatic discovery, which was really cool. So if you're writing code, you say, where do I look for this really good idea? Someone, some other team must have done performance testing. Where do I look? Oh, it's here. And it, of course, correlates to the project's, I say, score. This is how well they do in production. And what I mean by how well they do in production is, Fewest number of incidents, quickest time to recovery. That's, that's what we measure. You have another one. The, the diagram below it shows similar kind of thing, right? It's give me the best examples of logging and Kafka for some reason. And this is interesting. You can explore your, we can explore our code base this way. We can do one more, th we can do one better. We can visualize all projects. We can say, okay, what, what's a bad idea? That's not that interesting. What's more interesting is, what do the really good projects do, and what do the really bad projects do? So if I want to write software that performs as well in production as possible, what should I do? So we've done some more analysis on this, as, as you might expect. And grand finale, the, the clickbait, it comes from uh, some diagrams, but never mind. It's this. Four things successful projects do throughout their commit history. That was actually one of the most important things. It's throughout commit history. And so here they are. You want to do structured logging and performance, structured and performance tested logging throughout commit history. If your project spans 1,000 commits, if you do this at commit 950, it's too late. It doesn't make a difference. You have to do it at like commit four. What about monitoring distributed tracing? Same story, right? Yeah, you want all of these things in place and it might seem strange to say, well, what, what performance testing can I even do? I've just created Hello World Scala and mm. it has one endpoint, health check. Am I gonna performance test that? But, but yes, if you get the, the groundwork there in the first place, then you're off to the right start. I guess a consequence of doing that is that it forces you to set up your CI and CD pipelines. So yes, you have to have this code, but you have to have this code running right from the start. And really, like commit number 10 out of 1,000, not 500, by then it's too late. Performance testing, same critical thing. If you don't do that right from the start and just add it at the end of the project, from what we've seen internally, 
you're not going to be happy in production. You will have incidents. They will take a long time to resolve. And finally, this the reactive architecture and code, this, this is, feels like a, this, this big blanket statement. Um, but it is the case, right? You want to think about uh, recovery. You want to think about supervision. You want to think about timely responses to your requests. Um, interestingly, language doesn't make that much of a difference. You'll be pleased to hear. Framework doesn't really make that much of a difference. So we can no really leave it up to you. Of a scholar and yeah, you don't Java. have to fight at work. As long as you do these things, you'll probably be fine. We have two papers about this we'll, we'll share on our blog. Um, one describes the, the protocol testing and what we found out and what the impact was. And the other one is sort of large-scale knowledge discovery and how that works. Um, so we'll, we'll publish a blog post. That's probably the safest way to, to communicate with you guys. And uh, well, we have three minutes to go, so time for a few questions and then lunch.